Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. This is the first live session of the OER, sorry, the Open Education Global Online Conference. Um, as you know, this year we are focusing on the uh, UNESCO OER recommendation action areas. And this first session, this first live session, it's all about building capacity, right? So it's ways uh, the global open education community is advancing capacity to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute open educational resources. We have five presentations planned for this lovely uh, live session this morning. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the floor to Jacques Dan and his colleagues who will be talking about, give me a second so I can read the title. Actually, I can't find it straight away. So you could, Jack, just go for it. Share your screen, please. Yeah, I, I think it's actually it's Torun who is starting. So I'll hand it over to Torun. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome to this session on um, a course on OER and Creative Commons um, licensing for capacity building. I will um, share my presentation and my colleagues will, will join um, later. Um, I'm here, I'm, I'm Turun, I'm, I'm from Oslo, Norway, where the Secretariat of ICDE is um, hosted and I'm here together with my colleague Anaïs Malgrin who is the senior advisor um, and also um, coordinator for a project that we will shortly uh, introduce to you. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with ICDE, so we're the leading and oldest global membership association for open flexible distance learning. We were created back in Canada in 1938. So um, we have a long and proud history. Uh, we are a global not-for-profit NGO um, and we are hosted and partly funded by Norway since the 80s. And we've been a, a, in a formal consultative partnership with UNESCO since the 1960s. So what we do is we connect members and partners all across the world. We have members in more than 70 countries in all the world regions. And um, these members are uh, higher education institutions, vocational technical uh, institutions, uh, and also individual members, experts and student members. And uh, together with our members and partners, we are reaching out to over 15 million students across all continents. ICD has been involved in open education for a couple of decades um, through our members. Many of them are open universities and also obviously through our consultative partnership with UNESCO. Currently, we're having um, two major projects uh, focusing on OER. Um, it is the Encore project, which my colleague Rob from the Open University UK will present later in this session. And it's the ICD Francophone OER project. Um, that we will be focusing on today with this course. Um, and we also have a um, committee uh, of ambassadors of OER, the OER Advocacy Committee, which is chaired by um, our board member, Ebba Ossia Nielsen, who's also here today. And they will uh, also join in later in the session. So ICD is very much present um, here in this session this morning, which I'm very, very pleased about. Uh, and obviously, as Bea mentioned in the introduction, the OER Dynamic Coalition is really what we're focusing on today. Uh, and we should have had with us today also our colleague from UNESCO, uh, Zeynep Roglu, uh, the program specialist uh, from the communication and information sector. Unfortunately, she was not able to join. So I have uh, quickly this morning included a couple of her slides into my presentation, uh, trying to, to uh, fit that in. So this is, uh, here you see Zeynep's uh, contact details um, from the communication and information sector. And um, I really um, just want to hi highlight that the uh, UNESCO recommendation of OER is really the only existing normative instrument in the field of technology and education to date. 
Uh, it was signed by and adopted anonymously by all the UNESCO member states in November 2019. Um, so a very important uh, step um, for everyone uh, working for open education. And this um, uh, recommendation, it has uh, five action areas, which you can see now on the screen. And uh, those are building capacity, uh, developing supportive policies, ensuring inclusive and equitable access to quality OER, and developing sustainability models. And the fifth action area is facilitating international collaboration. And here is the dynamic coalition that UNESCO initiated and that many organizations and partners, uh, among them ICDE, uh, have been joining. It is to facilitate the international collaboration to support all action areas. So that was very quickly the link uh, between um, the recommendation, the dynamic coalition and um, today's topic. Um, here is also a, sli a slide from Zeynep where you can see that um, this course, well, this course that we will be presenting today, uh, it's a part of the mapping of OER capacity building courses. And um, this was a course developed by OERU in New Zealand in English um, on o OER and Creative Commons licenses, which now has been translated to French. And uh, this has been done in collaboration between OERU, uh, ICDE, UNESCO, and Université Numérique. Um, so the rationale for UNESCO to support this um, is presented in this um, slide. So um, now I will hand it over to my colleague from the Secretariat, um, Anaïs, uh, who's also coordinating this um, Francophone Africa project for ICDE. Um, I can just move the slides, Anaïs, when, whenever uh, it suits you. Um, I think it's easier this way. So, so please, Anaïs, can you take the floor? Yes, thank you, Torin. Hello, everyone. Um, I will just go quickly through um, the background of the course that is the project, the Francophone OER project coordinated by ICD in partnership with UNESCO and uh, the Digital French University, the Nord Numérique. Um, it came from a partnership between ICD and the French Ministry of Higher Education, Research and Innovation, which was a member of ICD. And um, we realized that we had um, the networks that could really be key to support um, OER uh, expertise within the Francophone world. And the um, participation and uh, organization of a summit that took place in Paris in 2018, which was also part, um, in partnership with the uh, OE Global, which at that time uh, was called um, the Open Educational Consortium. Um, set the ground to uh, this um, um, need for a francophone expert group within OER uh, and the uh, opportunity to get our networks together to support what was at the time the preparation of the UNESCO recommendation. Uh, but then when it was um, um, approved by all mandate states in 2019, then to support its implementation. And then the group, uh, the francophone OER expert group, uh, was created uh, with the participation, so the French Ministry of uh, Higher Education, Research and Innovation, the, uh, the French Digital University, uh, the Commission for UNESCO, the UNESCO join, also the Francophonie um, organization and the virtual universities of Senegal, Mali and the Republic of Congo. Those um, members are um, uh, represented and then at a later stage also the francophone chair of OER, uh, Colin de la Higuera, who's also um, very involved in the in the OER global um, uh, conference today. And, and we've met regularly and we uh, agreed on a project to support the UNESCO recommendation first in three countries of francophone Africa, which was uh, Mali, Senegal and Congo Republic. But then it also came um, through uh, other partnerships, uh, which maybe I can explain in, in the next slide, uh, Torin, the synergies uh, of other um, uh, 
uh, initiatives that were led in the country, uh, one of them, for instance, led by uh, UNESCO Dakar in Senegal, uh, which was also supporting the, the implementation of the recommendation, we uh, felt the need to expand to more countries and then included um, um, Burkina Faso, Benin, Burundi, Gabon, and Ivory Coast uh, in the scope. And we um, had the, the objective of the project was to connect uh, at the national and national level stakeholders at the ministerial and education uh, leadership level um, so that they could um, agree on priorities in the region to um, implement the UNESCO recommendation. And we were focusing on the two objectives, two first objectives, two first areas of the recommendation, which is capacity building and supportive policies. And so with the project, we um, realized also with the discussion with UNESCO, with, with the expert group, that um, there was um, possibility of including other uh, parallel initiatives to, to, to collaborate and to harmonize, and that we also had this uh, course that was um, created by OERU uh, and that uh, needed uh, um, translation so that it could be offered within the project, for instance, for the capacity building uh, exercises within the countries. And so uh, UNESCO translated uh, the course, and within the expert working group, um, we uh, supported with the uh, cultural validation because it's not only the language, it's also that uh, the references are relevant. Uh, and then the technical validation, in this case, for instance, the le legal context, uh, the difference between civil law and common law in uh, Francophone and English speaking countries. So all that's been something that's been taken by the French Institute University and, and they will, Jack and, and Carl will explain it later. But so that's key part of the project, the cultural approach, and also to document this process so that it could be replicable to other languages. We are considering maybe at a later phase to, to um, replicate in other languages, Spanish, Portuguese, if we say uh, Portuguese in the African region, Spanish in other regions. So that's that's also one of the um, ideas uh, in, um, in, this, uh, in this short project. Um, and the multi-sectoral approach. So it's the academical and politic, um, like ministerial level, we try to put them in contact uh, through workshop, the first pilot workshop took place in June. Um, and uh, so that we identify the needs and the priorities uh, in, the, in the targeted uh, countries. And then the capacity building um, aspect of the, of the project to, to identify needs and provide some tools. And the course that we present today is one of the tools that uh, we have, ha have been um, uh, presenting to the partners there and that they have themselves participated in the testing um, because we'll be, it will be launched um, in the ICD um, virtual um, uh, global week conference conference week uh, at the end of october and so before the launching we had a whole um, session of uh, consultation and of testing of the tool to confirm the the cultural uh, validity um, of its content and then yeah so just to finish on maybe icd torin uh, so because also we have the first presentation so we'll also take the chance to to welcome you to the community, uh, invite uh, those of you who not are, are not members yet to become a partner, to subscribe to our newsletter so that you know uh, much more about what we we'll present today. Uh, we are advocacy committee, the Francophone project, the Encore Plus project. Uh, follow us on the news, uh, Facebook, Twitter, on the social network, on LinkedIn. The blog that we also have, the um, ICD Insider, and the journal Open Praxis. We just launched a, a new version of the of the um, website for the journal. So we um, invite you, uh, and you're very welcome to participate. There is a call to public papers uh, um, three times, um, four times a year, and to read the content, which is also uh, on OER uh, and uh, and very um, um, relevant for this community. Thank you. You can also, uh, if you have any questions after the Q&A session, I would welcome to take contact with us at the general email of ICDE 
or directly with Tony Normi. Thank you. And now Jacques uh, and Carole, unless, um, yes, we'll uh, give you more details about the actual French adaptation of the course. So uh, I hope you can hear me well and welcome everyone. So I'll say a few words before this uh, presentation about the course itself that has been developed by Dr. Wayne McIntosh uh, at the OER Foundation. He also has the chair for Open Educational Resources in New Zealand. So he works a lot with UNESCO and uh, within the scope of the OERU initiative, uh, the OER Foundation has uh, shared with the global community a number of courses, and many courses, in fact. And among these courses are a set of courses which are called LIDA, meaning learning in a digital age. Uh, four courses, actually. And one of these courses focuses on the legal aspects, copyright and Creative Commons licenses. So this is, why is this relevant for the uh, capacity building on uh, aspect of the OER recommendation? I believe it's quite important for us within the scope of French speaking countries in Africa to have a shared understanding between the ministries of higher education, the governance of higher education institutions, as well as the educators themselves about what they should be aware of when building a course, building content, sharing content, uh, both for uh, non-commercial purposes and other purposes. So this is a great content that was shared by the OER Foundation, and we are very glad to have been involved in the adaptation uh, of the course and its uh, integration into possible curricula for uh, training and learning in French speaking African countries. So uh, I'll let the floor to Carole, who will uh, introduce this work that we have done on the LIDA 103 courses. And just mention to that Carole and myself are in charge of international relationships at Université Numérique, that she will tell you a few words about in just a few seconds. Carole? Hi. Um, now, we will speak uh, quickly about the technical validation and French adapt adaptation to this, to this uh, course about OER. Um, in the first time, l'Université Numérique is an association. She was founded in 2017 in order to simplify the landscape of digital in initiative about open education in higher education in France. Six thematic digital universities are grouped together in the Université Numérique. Each thematic digital university is dedicated to a specific disciplinary field, economy and management, health and sport, science and engineering, humanities, ecology and sustainable development, and technology. So in addition to this uh, shared uh, work in France, we also have a number of international partners, of course, IDCBE, Open Education Global, of which we will be proud to become a sustaining member in next January. Initiatives in, in Africa, as well as a number of European Union funded projects. Université so, Numérique uh, collaborate with ICD and UNESCO and virtual universities and ministries in, in West and Central Africa to, to promote UNESCO OER recommendation. And this partnership includes uh, a lot of partners and other partners who will join the group. We hope to. <laughs> So this course was, uh, as I said, offered by the OER Foundation, and it was extraordinarily well translated by the linguists at UNESCO. But further to this work, there needed to be a number of adaptation to the translated work, technical, legal, and this work has given us a, 
the number of lessons learned, and given us an idea about how to replicate the work in other languages. First of all, the civil law versus common law uh, uh, distinction. So, as you may know, there are a number of legal systems in the world. Uh, the most well known is common law for the Anglophone countries, the civil law countries that include both uh, Spanish, French speaking countries, as well as other countries such as Germany uh, and Japan. And why is this important? Because there is a distinction, uh, distincting point of view, different starting point. Copyright starts with the right to how do we regulate the right to copy a work? And intellectual property rights in the civil law countries focuses more on how do you protect one's more laws, more rights. And this translates into differences between the Creative Commons licenses and its use in civil law countries, because a Creative Commons law, Creative Commons license is non-revocable, but the moral right of the author in civil law countries is also non-revocable. So these are continent-wide uh, distinctions with also distinction between regions and also local adaptations. And there's also differences in between resolution of conflicts between judiciary norms, licenses between civil law countries and common law countries. So we learned that it's important to have a well-translated document to integrate adaptation of cultural issues such as currencies, examples, uh, cultural backgrounds. Also to have a range of technology platforms because the open source uh, world is, has a great variety of platforms. The importance of adapting ones to the generic legal system as well to specific frameworks especially in the case of Africa, and also lower level regulatory frameworks. How do you adapt uh, exploitation rights to the work contracts, to statutes of civil servants? And all this work has been quite substantive, but it hasn't given us some enthusiasm to move forward with other languages. If you can see the various initiatives we're working on, you can see that they represent various regional subsets the UNESCO Sahel Initiative for four countries, a wider initiative for the Francophone world, Lusophone countries which will, with whom we work and are also present in Africa, and also the great work done by the OER Advocacy Committee at ICDE, which nicely complements the countries we are already working on. So the next steps are, we are going to have uh, national and transnational workshops up a number of events in France, in online, in Berlin, in Nantes next May, and in Kigali also next May. So I think I have uh, just, uh, I'm just on time and I we would welcome any questions you may have at the end of this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much. Um... For anyone who has joined uh, when we were started already, remember we're not taking questions after each presentation. We are moving them all to, to, to the last part of, of this session. So do keep writing on the chat your comments. Um, if it happens that you lose the chat when you see the, the screen um, of the presenter, remember that you can actually, the only thing you need to do is exit full view. If you exit full view, you will get your, your chat back. At least that's what happened to me. So thank you, Jack and, and, and colleagues. We're now moving to the second presentation for this live session. And I'm going to welcome Judith Fatala. And she's going to be talking about new systems for open access books. So Judith, whenever you're ready. OK, so I'm going to share my screen now. Um, and I will go to my presentation. So can everybody see that okay? Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna start my timer for 20 minutes and I'll try and uh, keep pretty well to time. So this um, presentation will also be addressing capacity building from a somewhat 
different perspective. And I'm going to be talking about um, some of the new systems that um, the, pro the project that I'm working on is pioneering for open access books. Um, I'm sure some of you know that when it comes to open educational resources, books, academic books, are really lagging behind journal articles and other forms of research outputs, um, particularly in, in higher education in terms of availability. And that is what this project, COPEN, was established to address. I'm just gonna see if I can move us over to this side, it's great, so I can see my slides a little bit better, so we can all see them a little bit better. Um, so COPEN stands for Community-Led Open Publication Infrastructures for Monographs, and I've put down there some of the links to the main project website, the project Twitter, and the Open Pub Pub, where you can see all the documents from the project so far. The whole thing is an open project. And the, the remit of this project was to investigate, build, and maintain the infrastructures that are required to sustain open access academic book publishing into the future. So it's an international collaboration between researchers, universities, librarians, open access book publishers and other open access infrastructure providers. It was initially funded um, from November 2019 through to October 2022, um, but we're expecting um, an extension now through to April 2023 due to various reasons, which I'm sure you can all imagine some of the, <laughs> the delays that everyone is, has been through these past couple of years. Um, it's been funded by a partnership between, well, it's been funded partly by Research England, which is one of the main funding bodies here in the UK, through Arcadia, and um, from partners within our consortium. And you can see on this slide some of the members of the partnership. So, so far, we are looking to expand, but at the moment, um, Scholar Led is a group of leading open access publishers in. The UK, Europe, and the US. You can see some of the various universities there. Our partnership with the British Library, with JISC, which um, JISC is a revenue management system um, that sort of organizes payment subscriptions for open access content. And I'll talk a little bit more about our partnership with them later on. And some of the universities I am talking to you today from Lancaster University or remotely from Lancaster University because I'm in Wales but I work for Lancaster University um, and Coventry University, Trinity College, Cambridge are some of our other university partners. So first of all, before I get into the revenue and infrastructure management platform, I better tell you a little bit more about what COPEN is, the whole project. So COPIM is divided into seven work packages. I'll come back to work package two because that's what I'm reporting from today. Work package one is to do with managing, an app, managing the entire and overseeing the entire project and doing outreach um, to um, potential collaborators. Work package three, um, its initial remit was knowledge exchange and piloting alternative business models. So looking at the ways that publishers can make open access educational books available and the model, their progress now, the model that they've set up, settled on is one of the best that they're kind of helping to promote and, and uh, distribute is called Opening the Future, which is a model whereby um, publishers who want to become open access publishers um, take subscriptions to their backlist, which is closed, and then use that subscription to fund the publication of open access books into the future. So it's called Opening the Future, but there's a whole, there are a range of business models for open access books that don't rely on book processing charges because of all you know the issues with inequity around book processing charges. So they're exploring all of those. 
Um, community governance is to do with how, well, how do we manage this, this community around open access books cooperatively and in, a, in an egalitarian way that also is kind of effective and efficient. And I do some work on governance as well, specifically with regard to the revenue and management platform. Building an open dissemination system is work package five. Um, there are issues with the dissemination and distribution of open access books um, because publishers um, don't often have the same sort of set ways of working and distribution and dissemination that major publishing giants do because they're often smaller and they have less stuff and they have less established ways of working and I'll come back to that with regard to the platform later on. Work package six is concerned with experimental publishing. So moving beyond the idea of the traditional hard copy monograph as an open educational resource and going into digital publishing, living books, liquid books, different ways of making academic books, um, reuse and, the, and impact. And then work package seven, this is very important, is to do with archiving and digital preservation of open access books because obviously they don't necessarily exist in the same stable form and we want them to be maintained and findable into the future. So now I'll come back to the work package that I'm talking about today, revenue infrastructures and management platform. And our remit is to build a commute, build a collective and build a system or a platform through that collective to better manage the revenue and distribution and, and allow libraries and publishers to come together to fund OA books. So what we're addressing is the fact that as OA publishing becomes more popular in journals, books are lagging severely behind major publishers already have the workflows for getting these books into libraries and it's hard for small open access publishers to access those library funding schemes. So we held workshops and interviews with university librarians regarding the problems of access and making OA books available and they said that they often lack specific systems for discovery and dissemination the metadata can be poorly integrated and hard to find. So the OA books that there are are not being effectively accessed by institutions and libraries find it hard and time consuming to look at the different initiatives and know what to support and where. Um, so what we need is a collective that values collaboration and cooperation over competition and genuinely open publishing models that don't necessarily rely on the book processing charges which can just entrench the dominance of researchers and institutions that are already the hegemonic structures in their field and just cutting off access to publishing for less wealthy institutions and researchers and we want our model to be scalable so that the network can scale up rather than forcing individual publishers to scale up and become and incorporate in ways they may not be comfortable with. So we call it scaling small because we're, we want the network and the model to be scalable rather than forcing the publishers to scale up. And of course, a mutually supported network for the open access book community. So, sorry, that's an, I don't know why this is X because this is an old, the side. I'll come back to that in a sec. So the Open Book Collective is this new organization to address these issues and support and provide sustainable forms of financial support. An organization whose mission should go up there. Sorry about that slight error. We're probably going to found it as a registered charity in the UK for legal reasons that make it easier to manage that way. And it aims to be financially self-sustaining by the time the COVID project ceases funding. Our partners already include just, um, which is the revenue processing management partner for the UK, and then um, Lyricist in America to do the same work for us. 
And key to this endeavor is the Open Book Collective platform. So the collective supports the platform. The aims of this platform are to maximize the distribution of OA academic books and streamline the workflows that make them available in libraries whilst building the publishing models that will keep education open in the future. So we're gonna make it easier for organizations, including scholarly libraries to support open access, make it easier for them to understand and compare the different initiatives on offer to discover the range of OA content available, to see how these different initiatives align with the values and needs of their institution, subscribe to the membership programs that they offer. And we also offer, this is very important, metadata integration through um, this project called Tote. I won't have time within this presentation to follow up on that link to Tote, but you can do it later on. And Tote is a system that ingests the catalog of publishers and then produces content, comprehensive metadata for their books that is readable by the widest variety of metadata readers possible. And what we're doing then is supporting publishers with small and medium sized and other initiatives to work together collectively, such, such as Scholar Led is working collectively. So the stakeholders in our platform, we recognize as authors, librarians, consortiums, universities, researchers, publishers and infrastructure providers. All of these people are working together with the mission for sustainable OA educational books, but obviously they're gonna have needs and demands that are sometimes not entirely the same. And our challenge is for all of these people to work together in an egalitarian way as a collective that meets everybody's needs through this platform. So we're offering this platform to discover, access, and support OA monographs via high quality metadata and searchable catalogs that are open to everyone. You don't have to sign up to search the catalogs. It offers a choice of flexible subscription packages through which patrons who are subscribed can also participate in the governance and maintenance of the platform. And then on the other hand, there's space for open access publishers and infrastructure providers to display, promote, catalog, organize, and access these library funding schemes that they may previously have been cut off from. They may not have had the time to look into it. They may not have had the established workflows to access them. And then everybody has network op networking opportunities with librarians, institutions, and other end users, and a customizable members space. So right now, and I'm going to move us so you can see this a little bit better. Where shall I put it? I'll put this down there. So this is very much a project in development. So don't take anything I'm saying today as set in stone. Uh, and you know, we've got, I'm going to invite you at the end to help us and to participate because we want to meet the community needs. So this is very much a working document. But our current design set specs for the platform include a membership builder, so libraries can make their package in a kind of mix and match way. And then the ability to sign up at different levels. So you can make your package, check out what it'll look like, um, get the price, get the quote for what that would be, and then not buy it if you don't want to. A library viewport, so you log in, and then you can manage your subscriptions through a dash dashboard board an initiative viewport so as a publisher or infrastructure provider you can sign in and view your what you have on offer and what you're offering and tote integration as I mentioned before and um, right now the, the payment flow is looking something like this from the customer or the subscriber through the UK or US payment processor there's going to be European ones as well I don't know if that goes through the UK one or not or directly to the Open Book Collective and then through to the publisher or infrastructure provider. So that's what it's gonna look like. 
I don't have wireframes for you yet. Wireframes will come if you follow us on Twitter or follow me on Twitter. Um, what else have we learned? This is what our stakeholders have told us. The platform should be guaranteed nonprofit and it should remain so. So that's going to be in our um, statutes of integration. It shouldn't be focused. Sorry, gone too far. How do I go back? There we go. It should not be focused on individual titles, but offer a range of flexible subscription packages. I've done it again. So it's unlike Knowledge Unlatched or similar ventures in that way. It should be simple to use. The main thing that librarians are telling us is that they don't have time to compare all these different initiatives and decide what's the support. We already are meeting this idea of having support from local and trusted partners, and it should be collaboratively governed. Now, and you can get more detail on what else we've learned by following that link on the slide where it's part of our open publication documents. Collaboratively governed, what's that going to look like? We're working on it. That is um, part of this challenge that um, myself and Eileen Joy, the director of Pump and Books, is addressing with regard to the revenue management platform specifically. And our colleagues in Work Package 4 are obviously collaborating with us all the time on that. We're going to be running some workshops on governance soon which i think will probably be open to everybody so there'll be more information on on invitations coming um towards the end of autumn but what we're thinking right now is that all stakeholder groups are are represented at the level of this administrative committee at the top so we're calling it a concentric and cooperative model with a soft hierarchical com component it's a bit of a mouthful we'll probably change that soon we might take out the word cooperative because that's got legal implications. Um, the, in the center here is the Open Book Collective Pub Producers Group. So these people, publishers, infrastructure providers and collectives have a responsibility that libraries who are also part of the Open Book Collective don't have. Ultimately, the library's responsibility is to keep up with a subscription that we hope they would also want to be more involved with governance and development of the platform. The producers group obviously have a legal responsibility to fulfill their commitments on producing content, all of whom then are represented at some level at the administrative committee, the web platform set that sits at the bottom. Above that, we have the platform and membership management. Above that, we have the producers group and the libraries operate at all levels around it and everyone is represented on the administrative committee. We are still working on this. It's not finalized. As I say, nothing I say today is taken to be set in stone. And on that note, I would like to invite everybody with an interest in securing an equitable and sustainable future for open access books to connect with us and get involved in developing this platform which we want to launch in beta version in 2022, probably spring 2022. Um, so I am the research and outreach officer for Work Package 2. You can email me or follow me on Twitter there. The leads for Work Package 2 are Dr. Joe Deville, and you can follow him at Joe Dev on Twitter, and Eileen Joy, who is the founding director of Punkton Books, one of our open access scholar-led publishers. Joe is also... Um, a scholar-led publisher. He's just an academic as well. And he his press is called Matron Press, and they're also part of Scholar-led. And you can follow her at Irene A. Joy or email her at Punkton, Punkton Books. And I've put our general links um, down the bottom as well. And I think that is time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jules. Yes, exactly. Bang on time. So that's really nice. Um, let me just remind you, since uh, Judith was giving us all um, her contact details and, and um, all to her colleagues, um, just a quick reminder, you can, apart from you know, having a discussion at the end of, of, of the session, you can also ask questions and, and leave any comments for, for any of the presenters on, on OE Global Connect, and that's where you can also catch their slides. Um, so, you know, if any of you kind of thought about a question after this session, say, oh, I forgot to ask that, 
go to OEG Connect and that's what you're gonna connect. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to the next uh, presentation and that is Rob, Rob Farrell from the Open University. He's gonna be talking about innovating open education. So critical pathways and communities of practice. So thank you, Rob, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Bea. Um, morning, everyone. Um, see a few familiar faces here today. Uh, for you, those who don't know me, um, I'm Rob Farrow and I'm a Senior Research Fellow in the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University in the UK. Today I am going to be talking to you about the Encore project. Uh, Encore is the European network for catalyzing open resources in education. Um, you can check out the website encoreproject.eu. Um, there's a few links that I'll put into the chat when I finished um, speaking. So don't worry about uh, writing them down as I'm going. Uh, so Encore is a knowledge alliance funded under the Erasmus Plus uh, uh, stream. And um, there's quite a lot going on in the project, uh, but three sort of headline goals are to support the uptake of OER in Europe, um, to catalyze and share innovative and best practice across education and business, uh, and to develop stakeholder communities uh, of practice um, of various kinds and to uh, harmonize activity around OER. Uh, these are the partners on the project. Uh, we have ICDE in Norway, uh, DHBW in Germany, the Open University in the UK, UNIR in Spain, Knowledge for All in the UK, uh, Jubel in Norway, they run the H5P platform, FPM in Italy, Instructure Global, who manage the Canvas really, and Dublin City University in Ireland. And in addition to the sort of key consortium, we've got a much wider network of associated partners, um, of various kinds, different uh, NGOs, education interests, and uh, people from uh, business. Okay, so um, I just want to start off by giving you a bit of background about the project and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I'm not going to spend too long talking about the definition of OER, uh, because I think most people here will know. Um, but just a reminder, uh, and for anyone who's watching the recording who doesn't know, OER are educational materials that are either in the public domain or released under an open license that permits various forms of use, reuse and adaptation um, and enhance the freedoms of those who use them compared to proprietary resources. And so this lets you do things like the five hours of OER. Um, again, I won't go into it in too much detail, but essentially the point is that you get new permissions to retain, reuse, revise, remix or redistribute uh, educational materials of various kinds. So why are OER interesting? Um, there's a body of research now that suggests that OER have positive effects on learning. Um, they can do things like improve access to learning by reducing the cost, um, but they also uh, allow more diverse input into how learning materials are created um, and new ways of uh, sharing those and building on those. Um, there's also evidence to, to suggest that OER uh, in culture forms of critical reflection and pedagogical innovation. Um, there's also more flexibility in the way that open materials can be used and distributed. And um, this extends to things like integration into uh, learning management systems, um, but also stuff that's on the open web. Uh, and it also kind of uh, add some transparency to the way that educational materials are created and used. Uh, if you look at what's happening with OER in Europe, this is from the OER world map, which it's not necessarily exhaustive, but it's the best picture that we have of what's going on. Um, there's quite a lot of activity in Germany on this. That's partly because the map is based in Germany and how they collect data. Um, you'll see that there's activity across most of Europe, but it's quite irregularly distributed. Um, there's actually uh, nearly 1500 organizations on the OER world map um, and hundreds of uh, different services, projects and policies. 
But what you tend to find is that activity happens in clusters uh, or silos. So people are often um, uh, following uh, open initiatives, but there's not a joined up approach across countries or across Europe as a whole. Um, and in some ways, this is partly what the UNESCO recommendation is supposed to address, right? It's the greater harmonization of what's happening with OER um, in different countries and different regions. Um, and I think another important bit of context here is that the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, forced us into more use of online learning. Um, but most of the time that's happening in a kind of crisis management way rather than through the systematic uptake of OER. So um, some of the ideas behind Encore include um, encouraging more innovation in business through using OER because there's very little uh, use of open resources uh, outside education. Um, and then some of the uh, things associated with OER in general about improving access and um, encouraging um, more lifelong learning, uh, more generally supporting modernization and digitalization of higher education in Europe, and um, also to uh, attempt to synchronize formal and non-formal um, uh, learning by advancing new ways of recognizing how that um, learning has taken place, like micro-credentials and that kind of thing. So uh, we're intending to address five key challenges. So uh, the first one I've spoken about already uh, in the sense of uh, it addresses this idea that there's a fragmentation of OER stakeholders across Europe. So there are OER stakeholders, but they don't necessarily uh, act in a coordinated and synchronized way. Um, second need uh, that we address is the idea of interoperability um, between European OER repositories. So what often happens at the moment is lots of different repositories are out there, but they don't talk to each other very well. And so you can't do, for instance, a federated search of all the OER repositories at the moment. Um, so we have a technology work strand addressing that. Uh, another need is around uh, the lack of uh, institutional strategies. I try to avoid talking about policies only um, because you can end up just sort of writing another policy that doesn't necessarily do anything. Um, so there's also a strand here which is about finding strategies that work across different sectors and stakeholders. Uh, we have a quality strand which is all about trying to find the right quality assurance mechanisms for educational systems of the future. Um, and we have an, another need, which is the idea that we need uh, innovative approaches and business models based around OER. Um, and that's the sort of area that I'll be focusing on today. Um, so if you put this all together, the idea is, um, and we, we're thinking about this in terms of an ecosystem, rather than just here's some work packages. So um, it's trying to um, put forward and develop the idea that this is one big ecosystem. And um, you can see here in the graphic, we have the five needs around the outside. The four, four uh, circles on the inner um, ring are, um, we call them uh, circles. They're essentially communities of practice. And um, there's one around policies and strategy, one around innovation and business models, one around quality and one around technology. And so um, while we have various bits of work going on in the different um, work packages, uh, one important element of this knowledge alliance is to develop these circle communities. And later on in the project, we have activities where we'll be sort of bringing these different groups together. So I just wanna say some things around innovation and OER. Um, there is this kind of prevalent idea that uh, innovation happens a bit like the uh, moment of Eureka with Archimedes in the bath, right? This sort of moment, flash of inspiration. Now you know how to do things differently. Now you've seen something that you can um, work with. But actually, innovation doesn't necessarily happen like that. And it's much more about an ongoing process and culture. Um, and developing uh, places where innovations can be applied and can become uh, habits and um, uh, routines and ways of doing things that are new. Um, 
when you think about using OER and openness more generally, um, it's difficult to be categorical about why people move in this direction because people's contexts are quite different. And um, uh, Martin Weller has made suggestions along these lines that there's a kind of formal similarity between um, uh, different instances of openness. So for instance, there's a digital component, there's a networking component, and there's an openness component, but they're often realized in different ways, in different contexts. Um, so when we talk about innovation and someone being empowered to do something differently in their own context with OER, some of the reason why things happen in silos is because they are very contextual and they don't necessarily um, get rolled out like to, at scale. Um, but at the same time, openness is, is growing. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, I want to just look briefly at some theories of innovation and how they might uh, relate to OER. Uh, this is the task artifact cycle. It's, you know, what, 30 years old now? Um, this is the idea that there's a cyclical element to innovation. So we're always coming up with new tasks. That means we need to develop new artifacts or tools or techniques to meet those tasks. And this is an ongoing sort of process. And it does capture something about the way that people develop new resources to meet a particular need. Um, and in a way, what we're trying to do with openness is to sort of capture those artifacts and make them shareable and usable by others. But this only gets you so far in understanding what's going on. Uh, another influential theory of innovation is the diffusion of innovations. And so um, this uh, graphic shows you um, the yellow line is uh, overall market adoption and the blue line is the rate of adoption. So that's a sort of standard uh, distribution. Um, and the idea here is just that you have early, innovate, uh, early adopters um, and laggards, and there's a sort of uh, staggering over time of, of how um, things come to market and get adopted. Um, you might wonder where's OER in all of this? Um, in the uh, USA, which is arguably the place where there's been the most systematic adoption of OER through open textbooks, uh, you're looking at about 5% of market share uh, K through 12. Um, and that's pretty small, really. That's a quite a small, that would put, you know, anyone who's um, using OER in the States would definitely be an early adopter according, uh, or an innovator according to this uh, way of looking at things. And in Europe, it's definitely lower in terms of overall market saturation, which indicates a lot of potential. Um, just want to say briefly something about the, the Gartner hype cycle. You may have seen variations of this. It's a slightly controversial um, way of understanding how things come to market. Um, where you have this big sort of boost of interest at the start, um, a lot of it's sort of marketing um, fluff. And um, sometimes, you know, thinking about sort of 2013, the year of the MOOC and all that stuff, then we just only have 50 universities left by now. And, you know, if you were around in those days, then you, maybe you could relate to this. Um, I think there's been, a, there's been a paper published recently that says no technology actually looks like this, right? In terms of, this is, a, this is an idealized uh, curve. But if you look uh, in the trough of disillusionment, um, that's where you're sort of seeing about 5% adoption. So just before you get to the slope of enlightenment. So we'd be sort of around there. So you've had the kind of um, initial hype and now we're into the sort of plateau of growing and developing. Um, I put that there mainly for interest rather than because I think that it's true, but it's an influential way of looking at um, how innovation uh, happens and how it comes to market. Another um, approach which I think is important is the uh, something called Samir substitution, augmentation, modification and redefinition. This is um, applied to education um, and educational tasks and the idea here is um, as you get new tools and technologies you're able to rethink the tasks and rethink uh, what you're doing and this does map quite well onto open resources. Um, and if you think about substitution, this is often the first step in moving towards OER. You start replacing a proprietary textbook with an open textbook, for instance. Um, and we can sort of look at uh, how, just to use the example of textbooks, look at how um, this looks when applied to the framework. 
So um, you have, you, you know, the substitution. The augmentation part is now you can do things that you couldn't do before, like sharing the books for free, uh, putting them online, um, and that leads to things like improving access and so on. Um, modification at that level, we get to do new forms of collaboration, for instance, or new supplementary resources that you couldn't do because they're digital or whatever. Um, and at the um, redefinition level, there's rethinking whether a textbook is even the right way of organizing curriculum. So I think this maps quite neatly onto uh, OER uh, use. Um, and I'll say why I think that's important in a second. Um, so we're also looking at business models and I won't go into this in too much detail, um, but one way of thinking about this is uh, that some businesses are defenders and they're all about protecting their existing market share. And some businesses are more like prospectors where they're all about creating new markets, new approaches um, and new sources of revenue. Um, we're looking into these in uh, more detail in the project. Um, I wanted to quickly mention that uh, a couple of years ago, uh, someone published a sort of typology of OER business models. Um, and this also sort of maps onto the Samir framework. So one type is static. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these. Um, this is essentially just putting your resources online um, and it's sort of unsupported. Uh, interactive, this is a sort of XMOOC model where resources are online, but they're sort of structured and there's some, some automation. So there's some sort of uh, support, but it's not really human. Um, dynamic, which is more sort of blended learning um, and using LMSs, CMOOCs. And transformative, which is more kind of like uh, going beyond that model into links with industry um, targeted, uh, training and education, um, new forms of efficiency and so on. Now, arguably, these four um, types also map onto that Samir framework quite well, uh, substitution, augmentation, modification and uh, redefinition. So we're looking at these kind of things and trying to develop a kind of typology of business models. And the idea will be to um, to leverage the networks and the communities that we are in contact with to refine those and make effective value propositions. Um, just quickly, um, I think uh, this is the idea of open innovation, which is another sort of controversial idea. Uh, this is essentially the idea of a sort of transparent approach to, um, uh, to business, where instead of being very protective of your IP and your strategy, you kind of share that stuff. And, um, it's considered a bit controversial because because you know where's your competitive advantage coming from but it's much more along the lines of the prospector approach where it's about creating new markets and new ways of doing things rather than protecting market share and so uh thinking about what does that mean in practice um there are new markets emerging around things like authentication of learning uh recognition which i mentioned earlier um, proctoring examinations and assessment generally, quality assurance, platformization, and so on. So we're interested in exploring these new sort of um, opportunities for working across business and education and uh, supporting that kind of innovation. So I don't think there's much time left. So I'm just going to quickly say uh, what we've got um, coming up in the project. Um, so we'll be um, doing more desk research around innovation and OER. Um, the goal here is to develop a tool which can be used to evaluate instances of innovation. So to extract the interesting things and be able to describe innovation in comparable terms. Uh, and we'll also be sort of sharing um, showcases of good practice across business and education and uh, new business models and value propositions. Um, we are publishing every six months an innovation briefing. Uh, the first one's online on the website, and we have our main kind of report next year. And um, I mentioned the, the circles. So we have circle uh, events for this uh, strand of work uh, in September, next February, October, and then April 2023. Um, and in 2023, we'll also have our main sort of showcase coming out of the project. Uh, here are the details of the upcoming circles. Um, so uh, there's two this week and two next month. 
and I strongly encourage you to sign up for those if you are um, interested in any of these areas. Uh, the more perceptive among you may have noticed that the first circle is today. It's actually half an hour after this uh, session ends. And while I would never encourage you to duck out of an event as auspicious as OE Global, you would be welcome if you wanted to come along. Uh, the recording will also be available online. So um, that's another way to engage. Um, one other thing to mention quickly is that uh, as part of these circles, we're developing position papers. And so there's a draft position paper online, um, which we'll be discussing later today. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat and you're welcome to comment on that draft and engage with the project that way. I'd also just encourage you to sign up for the circles and invite personal contacts that you know are interested in this kind of area um, to join us as well. And um, yep, yeah, welcome to the network, welcome to the community, and hopefully you'll um, come and share your experiences. Thank you very much. Great, um, thanks Rob. Um, do share the links on the on the chat because that's that's actually uh, very interesting. There's a couple of comments on on the chat. Uh, so Gino uh, says thanks thanks very much for well Gino's appreciating the idea of having these frameworks uh, and also Michelle kind of talks about the connection with community building, but we can pick that up later on. Um, I'm going to go straight to our next presenter, who is Tahani Aldo Senami, who's got the most wonderful title for her presentation, The Rise of the Saudi Sun, Leveraging OER and Capacity Building to Promote Access and Openness in Education. Tahani, are you here? Thank you very much. Um, I'll be glad to share information about the Saudi Sun. Uh, thanks, Mia, for uh, um, um, let me share this uh, presentation. So I hope that everyone can see the uh, presentation. I'll set my um, uh, the timer to twenty minutes. And if I please uh, remind me if I um, if I'm taking much longer time. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for attending this um, uh, presentation and thanks for the OE Global for um, this opportunity to share information about the Saudi uh, OER project. So a little bit about me, I'm an associate professor of educational technology at Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz University from Saudi Arabia. I worked as a vice dean of in, uh, information technology and distance education and senior advisor for Ministry of Education and um, Education and Training uh, Evaluation Commission. Uh, my research interest includes um, uh, many topics, including open education and uh, innovation. Uh, as BM uh, said, uh, the uh, Saudi Sun, I'll give you some information about uh, the name. This, uh, the uh, Shams name is a short for uh, the Arabic, uh, uh, it's abbreviation for the Arabic Shabakat uh, al-Mawarid Saudiya, which is the uh, the initials of the Saudi uh, Open uh, um, OER network. And there's an uh, I believe an analogy that um, uh, the OER is something like the uh, the sun that gives you the benefits without conditions, without any conditions. Uh, uh, the sunlight you get it. Uh, in open and unconditional uh, terms. So SHAMS uh, is the main initiative of the National Open uh, Education Resources Program. And it is the national platform that offers uh, secure, reliable educational resources for, for all students, uh, teachers, uh, faculties, parents, and uh, interested people without the need of uh, registration on SHAMS. Uh, the National uh, Open Education Resource Program, it's a national program that aims uh, in enriching the educational content and support uh, education, and it seeks to find a sustainable uh, path to partner partnership, and it has, uh, it, 
uh, it will contribute to providing more educational opportunities as one of its mission. As my colleague uh, uh, Robert mentioned that the openness and digital resources uh, uh, has lots of potential in, in uh, adding new innovation education, uh, adding globalized and international internationalized perspectives. Uh, it enhances sharing ideas. Uh, collaboration, uh, national and international collaboration. It enhances uh, meaningful engagement among students and structures. Uh, it's also uh, um, a destination for social, economic and technology uh, convergence of interests. And it also promotes access uh, for educators and for everyone and uh, facilitates delivering and accessing uh, knowledge. Uh, again, as Robert um, uh, mentioned, the, uh, the definition for uh, the uh, OERs, according to the uh, UNESCO definition, it's any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or, in, or introduced with an open license. The nature of these open materials means that anyone anywhere can legally and freely copy, use, adapt, and reshare them. So uh, the, um, uh, the UNESCO recommendations uh, 2019 were built uh, on building stakeholders capacity to create access um, uh, and use, adapt and redistribute OERs, uh, develop supportive policy and OER, encourage inclusive and equitable uh, quality OER, uh, nurture the creation of sustainability models for, for uh, the OER and uh, facilitate international cooperation. And of course, the Saudi um, National um, uh, Resources um, Platform uh, adopts uh, uh, the UNESCO recommendations, but uh, for the, uh, uh, the presentation sake, we'll, we'll discuss the uh, building stakeholders capacity uh, to create access and re redistribute um, uh, OERs. I'm trying to uh, move to the next, um, sorry. So this is the Saudi uh, uh, digital uh, network or OER network. And uh, I invite everyone to explore the, the, the high potential of the Saudi uh, national uh, um, uh, network of, uh, that includes contributions from different institutions and individuals connecting people and ideas. Uh, there's lots of uh, products, uh, initiatives that stemmed from, uh, from uh, Shams uh, uh, platform. It's, um, it's been rewarded lots of uh, prestigious national and international awards. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk uh, uh, and give some um, uh, details about the, uh, the Shams, uh, the Saudi OER. Uh, network. So uh, the Saudi Resources Network, uh, as I said, shortened to its first initials, GEMS, or SUN in Arabic. It has more than 50,000 uploaded resources with uh, 37,000 published resources, uh, 2,000 uh, resources in review cycle. Uh, it has more than 20, uh, um, more than uh, 268 and um, uh, 80, uh, 854 Arabic OERs and 95 of them from Saudi Arabia. Uh, additionally, uh, it uh, uh, has um, uh, uh, more than uh, 5,334 educational content, more than 25,000 uh, courses, more than 12,000 activities, and uh, three, uh, 3, 000, uh, 30, sorry, three, 37 uh, videos, uh, more than 1,000 authors are contributing and participating in uh, Shams, uh, more than 50 institutions, uh, more than 7,000 Shams ambassadors trained between the um, years of 2017 and 19, uh, more than 50 workshops for more than uh, 5,000 educators, uh, around uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So as you can see, it's a very uh, huge project that it's a, a, a mega OER, maybe um, uh, in the whole Middle East, uh, serving uh, uh, educators and students uh, in the Kingdom and uh, uh, internationally as well. So this is the OER master plan framework and the organizational structure. And as you can see here, uh, there's the uh, the how the methodology and the actions, the stakeholders and projects, the SWOT analysis and the outcomes expected, uh, the incentives, the uh, how the, um, the monitoring and evaluating uh, the the, um, 
the members and contributors, the research and main indicators, and the goals linked with the sharing uh, processes, the efficacy, uh, um, the quality control, the awareness, the capacity building, access, and uh, funding. Uh, 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 so the uh, the national uh, uh, the national uh, OER program it aligns with these the ambitious Saudi uh, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's 2030 uh, ambitious uh, vision which which says that we will contribute uh, in investing in education and training and support our people with essential knowledge and skills for future jobs and provide all Saudi individuals with good education opportunities by offering a variety of alternatives. So the, the, the policy and main uh, um, vision of Saudi Arabia is to diversify knowledge resources and make it available for everyone. The national OER program, SHAMS, also aligns with the, uh, uh, the uh, sustainable uh, development goals, uh, including the fourth uh, quality education to provide inclusive and equitable quality education. Uh, 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 provide lifelong learning opportunities for all and uh, maintain integrated mechanisms for sustainability. The, the main strategic directions of SHEMS is to create a culture of uh, interactive open resources, uh, standardized uh, accred accreditation, sustainable partnerships, uh, uh, ensure a highly uh, efficient budget and investment in resources uh, of resources, um, also provide equitable lifelong learning opportunities and effective learning for all. Uh, the main goals or the key goals of SHAMS is to um, uh, enhance stakeholders' uh, participation in the enrichment of the educational uh, content, uh, enhance partnership with pioneering entities uh, regionally, uh, nationally, and internationally, uh, uh, support academics and students' participation uh, both nationally and internationally through nationally developed uh, quality uh, framework. Uh, the four actions that SHEMS follow to ensure the, the execution of its, uh, of its plan is to eliminate any potential barriers or challenges, including financial or accessibility issues, uh, provide free and open access resources for educators, uh, students with easy sharing and dissemination of license, ensure effective investment and sustainability of public funding, uh, create an environment of uh, creative uh, creativity and innovation uh, that facilitates uh, um, the communication among all stakeholders. Uh, so to, in, to maintain the sustainability of SHAMS, SHAMS uh, implemented a change management plan uh, supported by business continuity action plan, uh, provided a supportive team, uh, recruited the change catalysts, uh, to achieve uh, holistic design and implementation of education content of uh, digital courses, and uh, uh, the um, the early adopters, as um, categorized by what uh, Robert shared with us uh, recently about early adopters through the uh, change uh, change theory uh, by Rogers, uh, also. Um, uh, uh, one of the sustainability main uh, uh, factors was um, uh, supporting the administrative and financial governance structures of the program and um, uh, 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 organizing the, uh, uh, the organizational mechanisms, uh, regulations to disseminate, uh, stimulate, and increase participation in the program. Uh, the main, uh, the two main pillars that uh, Shams was uh, based on is is openness and shareability. Regarding uh, openness, uh, Shams was um, uh, uh, initiated uh, upon the pillars of providing free access to content, freedom of search and browsing resources, download and share content, or making the the platform open for uh, learners at any time. And the shareability uh, includes the collaborative approach in content creation and uh, uh, enrichment, sharing and improving the quality of open content, ensuring collaboration with experts and connecting with uh, educational uh, institutions. So uh, to, uh, um, uh, to add more details uh, regarding this the, uh, on the capacity building, so uh, SHAMS uh, ensured building capacity of internal stakeholders and staff capable of leading and uh, managing the uh, national OER, OER project, uh, project uh, including the administrative and management staff, 
and um, um, uh, raising the uh, human capabilities through training according to the program structure and task of necessary skills and the program implementation and administration. Uh, SHAMS also uh, build the capacity of external uh, stakeholders uh, through uh, um, uh, raising the skills, uh, upskilling faculty members, educational leaders, uh, supervisors, and teachers. Uh, also, they, the SHAMS platform provided training and digital content, authoring, curating, and, uh, and leveraging uh, OER uh, skills. Uh, the approach that SHAMS uh, followed uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, its uh, mission and uh, goals, first uh, through the access to SHAMS platform and enhance its application. And the goal was to ensure that all students and faculty with SHAMS mem uh, has a membership to join the platform uh, during the fourth quarter of 2017. Uh, teachers were, were provided with membership during the second quarter of 2018. Uh, second, uh, SHAMS provided continuous content improvement and support with rich educational resources, uh, uh, in addition uh, to a sustainable financial support for the operation, uh, development, and content enrichment. Uh, uh, including, uh, uh, in addition, uh, it's very important to mention that uh, one of its uh, main approach to, to maintain its sustainability and achieve its goals, uh, SHAMS set, uh, set the regulations for licensing policies uh, for um, open educational resources and intellectual rights of authors. Uh, it's uh, regulated the relationship with stakeholders with the open educational resources. Uh, ensured the implementation of proper mechanisms for utilizing appropriate uh, OER license uh, through enabling, replicating, modifying, compiling, and distributing uh, content. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it ensured the adoption of policies and regulations for building uh, OER from educational uh, services. So in, in, in 2019, the Saudi Resources Network uh, were expanded to include all Saudi universities, general education directorates, and training institutions. So among the uh, main achievements of SHAMS uh, program is uh, um, uh, the successful partnership with uh, national entities, including 16 uh, universities and four ministries, uh, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Communication, Information, uh, technology, Ministry of Human Resources, and Economy and Planning, uh, uh, a partnership with Education and Training Evaluation Commission, Public Administration Institute, uh, Technical and Vocational Training, Saudi Aramco, Saudi Digital Library, and the Saudi Research and Innovation Network, uh, Ma'in Network. Uh, in addition to that, uh, key, uh, it, well, there was a, a successful uh, partnership with key uh, private entities in e-learning and digital content, including Durub, uh, Tatwir Holding and other entities uh, uh, with international, uh, 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 very effective and successful international partnership with the uh, ISK, ME, uh, E2F, uh, OER Educational Resources, Achieve, uh, Creative Commons, and UNESCO. And uh, due to this successful uh, uh, administration management and partnership of the uh, Saudi OER program, uh, a, a major uh, eight uh, successful initiatives uh, stemmed out of this uh, project, uh, including Shams platform that I just uh, shared uh, uh, with everyone and uh, invited everyone to, to log in and uh, explore the, the, the platform. Uh, the Shams Author, Shams Cloud, uh, Rabih License, uh, OER Distinguished Achievement Award, uh, Shams Ambassadors, uh, Shams uh, Sana, and Shams Certificate. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about each one of these initiatives. So regarding the courses, uh, there, there is a tw more than 22 higher education fully online courses uh, developed by King Abdulaziz University, uh, more than um, 4,000 uh, high quality education resources for K-12, from the Ministry of Education. There's the digital content repository. Uh, also, there's the digital content design, uh, which is, uh, enables uh, professionals and, uh, and instructors to develop content and uh, um, uh, aligning with the instructional system content. Uh, also, uh, providing social communication content and more than one, uh, 110,000 Creative Commons licensed photos. Uh, SHAMS also provided tools for knowledge creation and dissemination, including voice recognition technology, uh, hotspot pictures, uh, answers, uh, guessing, uh, Twitter feeds, video and audio chatting, 
uh, compatibility with our, all your international standards, uh, uh, compatibility with uh, metadata, the LMS, IMS, and other uh, uh, products. Also, there's the uh, Shams um, uh, cloud technology of index resources with keywords and descriptive data information, including the title, author, educational content type, and license type. And uh, all contributors were provided with good practices uh, uh, training uh, to upload the um, uh, open, uh, the shareable content. And also the um, uh, the Shams Cloud uh, um, provided technical support uh, uh, um, to uh, to uh, to the team. Uh, also, uh, the, there's uh, the, the Shams training, which is a professional licensing through uh, gamified training program of six, uh, six levels, and each level uh, ends with Brabeh or in in English champion of knowledge with no boundaries license. That includes uh, the training programs uh, consists of OER future instructor basic and advanced with specific pre prerequisites on digital knowledge and skills. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each program that has its uh, specific topic offering OER knowledge and uh, skills and values. So uh, number one and two, there's the uh, program training program for uh, OER best practices and Shams platform features and tools. There's the knowledge and skills training on design and creation of multi-educational media. Number four, Shams author uh, portfolio. Uh, number five, prepare instructors on e-courses and design skills, uh, technology implementation in education. So all these were uh, upskilling uh, 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 training workshops for uh, members and contributors. Uh, the <clears throat> the uh, Shams training included as well instructional and training materials, uh, um, training on Creative Commons uh, uh, rules and regulations, authoring and publishing rights, Creative Commons building blocks, uh, Creative Commons usage and license uh, publication, uh, Creative Commons for educators and for teachers and for uh, OER for everyone. So uh, the number of trainees uh, uh, reached uh, 7,000 members of Rabih license, more than 200 training hours, uh, 15 universities membership, uh, 70, more than 75 educational institutions, uh, 376,000 3, uh, 3, um, uh, resources, uh, more than uh, 108,000 uh, resources uh, in the platform. Uh, the, the, there was the Shams uh, also uh, award for community engagement with OER, uh, and uh, it was on three categories for, for institutions, individuals, and the private sector for the dedicated and distinguished participants. Uh, the Shams ambassadors in, uh, recruited uh, program and recruited uh, talents in, the, um, in digital content production and publishing through OER and facilitate the contribution uh, in Shams. Uh, finally, the development of Shams uh, to and keep its sustainability uh, develop, uh, through the, the support of the cloud computing and the single single access. And uh, I'm sorry, and uh, develop the tools and means for writing and digital assessment, build digital curricular applications, provide digital contents of both synchronized and asynchronous courses, uh, meeting um, and meetings, uh, also repositories for educational training and digitiz digitization. And also the, the Shams Innovation and Research Program, which includes scientific reports, studies, articles, and journals relating to open educational resources and the National Forum for uh, Participation in the Circulation of Ideas, Innovation, uh, Research uh, Results, and Scientific Trends in the Open Educational Resources, and also including uh, some um, in, uh, research and in innovative resources for uh, funding and sponsorship channels. And uh, here is the uh, Open Idea Saudi uh, uh, resources, Shams. And uh, I would like to thank you, everyone, and we'll uh, uh, wait for um, the question Q and A's at the end of this session. Thank you very much. Wow, that was pretty amazing, I must say. So thanks very much for sharing all that with us. Um, as uh, Pam said, we take questions in mostly, like I said, in, in nearly 20 minutes. So I'm gonna go straight for the last presentation of this session. And this is gonna be Eva, Eva Ozeal Nielsen, talking about global monitoring of the UNESCO OER recommendation. So Eva, the floor is yours. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. So uh, thank you very much um, uh, for the possibilities uh, to be here at the OE Global Conference. It's a great uh, pleasure and honor. 
And um, thank you, you uh, participants, for being with us here. I will talk about the global monitoring of the UNESCO OER recommendation. Uh, actually, from the beginning, we had uh, submitted a workshop, so, so it should have been longer. So maybe you have seen that if you have looked uh, in advance for this presentation. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm so happy to be here with uh, my distinguished uh, colleagues who have talked so um, very uh, enthusiastic and impressive about the uh, uh, implementation of the OER. So I will do the, the presentation on behalf of uh, all of us uh, from the OER, ICD OER Advocacy Committee. Uh, and here we are. <laughs> uh, so myself, uh, I'm a professor in innovation in open online learning. I'm based in Sweden, and I'm also, as Turing was saying this morning, I'm in the ICD board, and I'm also sharing for the third mandate period the ICD OER Advocacy Committee. It's a great pleasure and honor. I have been in the area of OER since it really started in back in 2002. And I suppose many of you have, were there too. Uh, in um, Sweden, I'm the, the Vice President of the Swedish Association for uh, Distance Education. I'm also uh, working for the International Council on uh, Bachelors, Bachelors and Credentials, uh, just to mention uh, some of my activities. Um, I'm an independent consultant and a researcher and an expert in the field. So I have some of my colleagues here today. For example, Jan Francis Obiade Agbu from Nigeria, and also uh, Hakan uh, Shenki Hakan Aydin from Turkey. We have Melinda uh, de la Pena Badalaria from Philippines. Uh, Daniel Burgos is here with us today from Spain. Uh, we have also Xian Yangshan from China here with us today. We have uh, Rosa Leonora Olya Casares from Mexico, and Mafina Macau from South Africa. She is also with us uh, today. We have Christina Guzmao from Brazil, uh, Yi Yang from the US, and Constance Blomgren from Canada, and Trisha Chaplin Shane from New Zealand. She is also here with us today. So as you see, we are 12 ambassadors and in the uh, ICD OER Advocacy Committee. And we have also, um, for this period, uh, uh, the third period, uh, we have ambassadors from all continents and all regions of the globe. So that is very, very good. Um, I will share some of the activities that what we have done the last year. And some examples from some of my colleagues which have shared that, that with me. So first of all, uh, the ICD or Advocacy Committee uh, was launched in 2017 uh, at a uh, ICD conference in Toronto. So as I said, we are now for the third period and I have been sharing the committee since then. So we have, uh, of course, some guidelines uh, for us who are working with uh, as uh, ICD uh, ambassador, we are ambassadors. So of course, the main task is about advocacy in all kind of means. Uh, it was like that, that uh, there was a call uh, from uh, ICD uh, looking for ambassadors. So uh, each of the, the ambassadors you saw on the list had applied and there was um, uh, no nomination and then the, um, the advocates committee was, uh, um, was, was started. Uh, so we really looked for the global uh, outreach. So of course, um, the basis for this uh, period, which is the uh, 21, 22, um, it was actually um, approved by the board uh, to have a period of four years, but we decided to have it two plus two in case, because it was quite a long time to maybe commit yourself for four years. So we had for the ambassadors are now for two years. And of course we are following the strategic plan, which is uh, newly um, launched by, by ICD and also from the activity um, plan. So we're working very, very much in a close collaboration with ICD and we used to meet uh, once a month and uh, also have uh, input from ICD. And we also report to ICD uh, two times uh, a year. <clears throat> 
I think each of us have um, had some kind of this slide, what we mean by the recommendation. And as the two and us were saying this morning, it is the first one uh, on education, and it's actually just the 12th one from UNESCO. So that also shows how important this recommendation is for implementation. And as we all know, it has been a long process, uh, started back in actually 2002, so some years, but I know that the last four, four years at least, there was a huge um, uh, work on, on this uh, to, to get to this done. And as we know, all member countries, uh, member states um, adopted the recommendation. I will of course not go through it because we all know, know what it is about. But I think it's important to have my presentation in the context, but maybe I would like to stress about the stakeholders, because that is very important as the stakeholders are both, both the formal and non-formal and informal sectors, and more or less uh, all kind of professionals are involved to make this happen with the implementation. And that really means what was also stressed by, by Rob about the ecosystem. We need to work together in different kinds of sectors and see OER as an ecosystem, not just the resources as such. Um, this has also been shown uh, by my colleagues, um, but I think it's important to see that uh, the recommendation is so, um, so wide and so broad because it is about building, developing, encouraging, nurturing, and promoting and reinforcing all those five areas. But it is also about monitoring and evaluation. So everything we do in the sector of um, OER implementation, we also have to monitor and evaluate. And of course, to do research about. So I will now show uh, briefly uh, some examples uh, from, um, uh, from some of the regions. I will start with the South Africa from, um, so we'll do it in alphabetic order. Uh, last week, uh, actually the second, 22nd of September, there was a fantastic colloquium uh, hosted by the South African Department of Higher Education and Training Research. Uh, and uh, uh, before the colloquium, there were five webinars uh, and it lasted during three weeks. It was really, really high level uh, conference with all the ministers and with, all a, lot of, uh, with a lot of um, um, chancellors from universities uh, all over Africa and also with international guests. Uh, I myself and also Mafina um, Macau was invited to give speeches. And I will say that uh, the key message from the conference at this very, very high level uh, colloquium was about the future of education is simple. It is about open, flexible and learning and the implementation of OER. So that was the main message uh, from this colloquium. And I think that is very, very strong. It's a very, very strong message. <clears throat> um, I wrote a blog post uh, about this conference, so it will be uh, hopefully published by ICD in the coming week or weeks. I posted it uh, yesterday. <laughs> I have some examples from uh, Mexico, what they are doing. Uh, they have a comprehensive um, um, platform which aims to contribute, oh, sorry. Um, uh, uh, maybe more space, uh, and the space aims to contribute to human and supportive training that strengthen the students' communities, values, attitude, aptitudes, and abilities, and to achieve um, integration on environment to search for better living conditions. It is in Spanish, Spanish at the moment, but maybe it will be translated as well to English. And the resources are used for leveling uh, academic skills and for online study of newly enrolled students. And they are doing some analytics about it, it is of this uh, repository. <clears throat> so it started uh, actually from August uh, last year, and they have uh, now um, some 250 students, uh, not uh, the numbers that uh, we just heard from, um, from my colleague, but it is uh, in a starting position. Uh, 70, 
over 70 uh, enrolled uh, the leveling course and um, and from now from January this year uh, they have uh, 700 students so that means uh, during this uh, short time it has been up and running it has increased uh, more or less uh, almost two times so it is a promising uh, a natural in, uh, initiative from Mexico Another one is this um, platform uh, for citizen security. And they have a lot of uh, resources um, uh, from this for this uh, at this um, at this uh, platform, how how to uh, work with um, citizen uh, security and how to learn about that for citizens. It's a great initiative from Universidad de, de Guadalajara. We have one initiative from New Zealand, which is in collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning about digital skills for OER sharing. And the, this course uh, is uh, in collaboration also with OER University and with Wayne McIntosh. And our ambassador from uh, Trish uh, from New Zealand, uh, her colleagues is, have been working on this initiative. And it is a course uh, over three weeks and they would especially uh, focus on um, US learners, teachers from the Pacific Islands. And it uh, started uh, now in September, and there are some thousand learners already. <clears throat> so from our country, um, Sweden, um, we had recently um, an assignment from the government about uh, learning resources in the schools. Uh, in, um, in the K-12 sector. And it was about, uh, the, the aim for that was to strengthen the librarian's uh, uh, function and the um, uh, uh, information system, uh, how to um, better serve, uh, serve the learners in the schools with uh, learning resources. And just some uh, citations, which uh, was from this um, uh, report is that um, they, because they refer to the UNESCO OER recommendation that schools have to um, uh, apply uh, the use of OER for quality resources. Uh, actually, they also say that, said that um, it is, as you can see in the first one, that um, UNESCO have not got maybe so many uh, reports uh, yet uh, about the implementation as they used to monitoring uh, recommendations every fourth year and it was not four years since uh, it, it was launched so maybe not so many reports uh, so far uh, but uh, uh, the Swedish government have to monitoring it and uh, of course um, uh, report uh, as soon as they can and it was also recommended recommended that um, uh, that uh, the, the concept of OER uh, should be used and should be implemented in, uh, in schools. As the learners need to have uh, access to good quality teaching materials. So that is very important. When the recommendation uh, was out in 2019, uh, we were uh, some volunteers um, starting to work uh, as we, what we call Meeting Place OER Sweden. It is actually uh, running now by uh, Wikimedia Sweden. So we um, uh, come together and discussed uh, what we had to do. Of course, we were in discussion with the, the UNESCO um, board in Sweden. And, uh, they couldn't do so much, unfortunately, because they didn't have, uh, at that time, the assignment from the government, and the government hadn't uh, uh, got any, uh, hadn't um, uh, set any recommendations what to do and who should do it. So we started, um, actually, and UNESCO supported us. <laughs> so what we did was to immediately set up um, a web plate, place which we call Meeting Place OER Sweden, where we gather all uh, kind of resources, both the uh, international ones, of course, those from UNESCO and the uh, UNESCO OER uh, Dynamic Coalition, and also the Swedish resources we know about. And we have also um, 
sent out, of course, information in our network to gather resources to have this some, some kind of hub, national hub. We also uh, launched a web uh, um, a platform on Facebook, which is the one to the to the right. Um, sorry, I will say about the, the meeting place of OER Sweden as well. We um, started immediately to translate the recommendation because we thought that uh, Swedish is a less used language. Uh, it is um, easier to understand what it is about when you can read it in your own language and contextualize it because language is not about language as such, it's also about the culture and the tradition and history and this kind of things. And you use different kind of words, which is in, in the recommendation. So that was the first task we did. Uh, we we uh, discussed that with UNESCO uh, board and then they said it was a very good initiative and also supported it very much, but they couldn't still do anything, but they um, really supported us and uh, thanked us also for the work we, we did. And I can say that uh, since we, we translated it, it is much more easy for uh, our networks, for our members, for our colleagues to, to rely to it and to really see what it is about that it is so broad and not just about open textbooks or short resource, resources or recording films or whatever, but it is in all those five areas and also the background about it. <clears throat> um, we also decided in, the, in this uh, group that we need to do something larger. So we decided at, uh, to, to host a conference for decision makers on the uh, second uh, anniversary day for the, when the recommendation was out, the 25th of November. So we are planning for a large conference uh, for decision makers at all levels, at government level, at the authorities, at the business levels, at the um, university and school levels. And we already have some speakers uh, um, confirmed. And that is um, Seine Pivaraglu from UNESCO or Dynamic Coalition. It is um, uh, Anna Karin Jansson from the Swedish UNESCO uh, board. She is the General Sec uh, Secretary General. We have uh, uh, Turin Jelsvik uh, from ICD. And we have um, Mikael Andersson from the U University uh, in Higher Education, from, uh, the University of Higher Education um, Council. And we have, of course, the students. The Swedish Student Union. And there will, of course, be some, some more uh, speakers, but we have speakers at a very, very high level how we can work on implementation of the OER recommendation with high quality and at all kinds of levels. Um, last week, uh, Friday, last week, we had um, uh, the Swedish Association for Distance Education's annual conference. And then Meeting place OER was um, uh, presented there by, by Wikimedia. And actually that was, I think, the third or fourth time we presented it at the national conferences. So um, some other activities, what we are doing in um, uh, ICD OER Advocacy Committee is, as I said, of course, about advocacy. Uh, we work uh, with the, the ICD virtual conference week. We will have presentations there. And uh, many of us are um, in the scientific uh, committee for the conference. We also work with the ICD leadership summit. Uh, I myself, I'm, the, I'm in the program committee. And we work together with ICD for their newly made, <clears throat> uh, advocacy campaign. And of course, we are following uh, UNESCO or our dynamic coalition, and we are also involved in the network of open organizations and used to participate in their monthly meetings and follow their work. Open Praxis, uh, the journal from ICDE. Uh, many of us are uh, reviewers for the journal, and we're also planning some publication, publication there. Uh, we work with Arol because one of our ambassadors is um, the chief editor for that journal. We work together with Open Education for a Better Word. 
Um, I myself am working on that. We have two um, uh, two persons which are, who I worked with this year, and the last year I was also involved with one um, colleague. We participate in conferences and we publish a lot in different kind of journals, um, book chapters, uh, reports, etc. So maybe conferences and publications is one of the largest um, uh, tasks we, we have. Uh, for the second mandate period, we did a survey on the OER uh, implementation. It was um, actually mentioned by Jacques as well in the morning, and this is this one. Uh, we decided at that time uh, when the recommendation had been out for a while to um, see how it was implemented uh, around the globe. And we had a survey out and we uh, published this uh, report. And as you can see, uh, we had uh, answers from all the regions. And um, when we, we work also together with UNESCO and SANEP uh, together with this and had discussion, discussions with her and also with the network of, organization, uh, of open organizations. And um, the report is, was published uh, in 2020. And um, the summary is uh, translated into those uh, different languages where we had um, ambassadors from. So English, Chinese, French, Hindi, Portuguese, Spanish, Swedish, and Turkish. <clears throat> so um, some more yeah, activities what we're doing is of course this conference. And um, many of us are, have been reviewers. Uh, many of us are shares uh, during the week. And uh, besides this presentation uh, for today, um, ambassadors have a lot of presentations during the week. So please uh, follow us. We have a LinkedIn profile. So you can also, you're also most welcome to see what is happening there. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, I'm sure if you have any questions later on, uh, both me and my colleagues who are here, um, I'm more than happy to discuss with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. This is the time for questions now. So the floor is open to you all. Thank you to all our presenters. Um, feel free to write your comment on or your question on the chat, but also you can open up your microphone and speak freely. We are all friends here. So um, if anyone wants to take the floor, probably if you want to raise your hand, so if you go to reactions at the bottom of your screen, you will see how one of those options you have there is raise hand. So so if you're using the technology, you might as well use it too. Cool. So does anybody have a question? Does anybody have a comment for any or all of our presenters? Yeah, so I will be a chair with four legs if I didn't have a question myself. So let's kick it off. So here's my question, guys. Um, and I have more than one. I'm just gonna try and break it into smaller questions. So we have been talking. So we're talking about building capacity, right? So it's about building capacity. Uh, from the first presentation, there's been kind of this comment about. Um, trying to uh, figure out um, what are the different priorities for people with different needs from each of the different regions, right? So the question is, how different are those needs and priorities? Uh, so that's the first one. How different is, how different are those, uh, is, are they really different or do you see a common pattern of people work in different contexts? Um, and then, is there a global response to the local needs and values? I'm like it's straight to ICD. Oh, Rob, you're opening your mouth, so go ahead, go for it. Yeah, the fatal mistake. Um, so, just thinking about what you said, and in some ways, there's quite a lot. Of capacity right there's quite a lot going on and it's a global conference right there's stuff happening all over the place but there's an issue around how we coordinate and make the most of that um, because sometimes 
it's easy to start reinventing things or to um, uh, repeating what someone else has done, but in, 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 a new, in a new context. And there's, a, you know, part of the whole idea with um, sort of reuse and reappropriation of, of resources is that you don't have to start from scratch again every time, right? There's something to build on. So, um, so I think it's partly a matter of increasing capacity, but it's also a matter of making more coordinated use of the capacity that we've got. Um, which obviously I spoke about a bit in my presentation, um, but that's yeah, that's a way of another way of looking at it. It's not just about purely increasing it; it's also about coordinating it and becoming more efficient. Well, um, our colleagues in the library sector tell us that when it comes to looking at models for funding and distributing at least OA books, and I'm going to talk about books because that's what I know about. One model is definitely not going to fit, not even within a European country, leave alone between European countries, because the funding agreements are so different. The systems of like reward for academics are different, and the systems for getting books distributed are different, and people have different kinds of money to invest. So we have to be able to support a variety of approaches by OA initiatives, be that publishers or infrastructure providers, and find a way to connect them. And as you say, allow them to reuse and build on what's already been done in a way that doesn't duplicate labor, but equally doesn't impose conformity because the same model doesn't work in different local contexts. Uh, I'd agree with that, but um, I wasn't sort of implying we just take what works in one place and apply it everywhere else. It was more the idea that we, we become more efficient by sharing precisely those kind of experiences and what works and what doesn't work rather than everyone having to start from scratch again and yeah. solve all the problems again themselves for their context. Some, yeah. of it, some of it is transferable. And it's, I think it's more about the culture around it, right? It's, if you like, it's a sort of open educational practices angle where it becomes about sharing the benefit of experience transparently rather than in a kind of competitive way, for want of a better word. Um, and that being the sort of the foundation for it. Um, so I would call that a form of coordination rather than... Yeah, cool. I think coordination is a good word for it rather than <coughs> rather than consolidating. I think coordination is a good word. I don't have COVID, by the way. I tested and I just thought... <laughs> Sorry. Maybe if I can also uh, intervene from the... Like, you link between the... the um, uh, reality of uh, a very particular context, or for instance, in our case, the language, the French language, and um, the needs global um, um, openness, uh, the, 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 the concept of openness, which we are, um, uh, is, um, I think, uh, like the whole philosophy about uh, open educational resources is that uh, access for everyone everything is shareable, uh, transparent. Mm, how do you match this? And I understand a bit that's, that's what you're asking us, is if there is specificities and if, if the global uh, offer of OER can uh, respond to the, to the national and, and reality of, of a, a national language. And so we've been confronted to that uh, in the, this French uh, speaking group. And not only that it was a French language, it's also the culture, because uh, a French speaker from France has not the same references, cultural references necessarily than a French speaker from Africa or from Canada. Or, so that's, that's been also, that's something that's, that's um, also uh, present in the recommendation, the, the need for adaptation and for a, for a um, multi-language approach. Um, in our case, uh, we, we bump into it uh, every time. Uh, there is also um, 
was trying to map. There is an issue with the, at least the French um, uh, offer of OER. There is a high dominancy of English speaking OER because of the history of OER. And so one of our partners, for instance, uh, has a project now um, uh, in collaboration, actually, also well, we're all <laughs> connected here, but uh, uh, through robots uh, algorithm to identify uh, which French speaking OER are around now. And then the index is, indexing is an issue because for the robots to be able to identify the NISP index in a, a specific way, uh, so that's another um, like to, to respond to a specific need, a language what are the French speaking OER available today, then you bump into new challenges. So it's something that you have to have in mind. Um, I think the recommendation gives the, the framework uh, directions to, to support us in the, the work, but then we also need to be uh, aware and, and try to, to map. And that's what we're trying to do for the Francophone world, Francophone African uh, partners that we have specific needs and how we can best support um, um, our different partners, how can each region identify in partnership, like the multi-stakeholder I think also is key as uh, Anka, um, Rob presenting the Anka Plus project is trying also to, to put this business world with the academical world in contact so they can together map what's um, the needs and the, the, the partnership, the connection between the different stakeholders and the, the mapping and the, of what's there and what can be um, proposed as, um, as tools. And, and the um, um, adaptability, keeping the, the multi-language part so that what Eba mentioned too about the Swedish, they started to translate the recommendation in Swedish so that they could talk to the partners in the country and it will make sense for them to work with the, that that's that's something that's also well, we've seen at least that uh, that is crucial. Hi. Yes, uh, I, I totally agree with everyone and uh, I agree with Rob when he uh, mentioned the word uh, uh, coordination. Coordination is key here. Uh, there's a lot of efforts that's um, uh, been done in the Arab uh, uh, coalition for OERs. And uh, we are sharing a lot of um, lessons learned, uh, discussing uh, business models, the frameworks for OERs. There's um, a very important component that each uh, country can learn from each other, like for example, the budgets, the the fine, the funding uh, models, uh, the investment, the keep how to keep the um, uh, the sustainability of these OERs, uh, regulating the um, the relationship of stakeholders, uh, the um, setting the rules, the mechanisms, uh, the uh, governance models. So all these uh, frameworks and models can be shared and. Uh, um, and um, uh, benefit from to not reinvent the wheel and um, uh, benefit from uh, uh, countries' uh, cases and uh, uh, share best practices and uh, lessons learned. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I have a question for everyone. I'm wondering about the, the um, in, in your uh, 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 countries respectively, uh, how the OER was um, working during the pandemic how students and faculty members were connected to these resources to benefit from. This is really um, a question that I'm thinking about for everyone. Mm, if I can, I don't know, I will give the floor to Eva because she will be more expert even than me, but I think the OER survey that she mentioned, the OERC survey that she mentioned had tried to identify the before the pandemic and after the pandemic and within the implementation of the of the recommendation if the countries had uh yeah well so by <laughs> please just uh because i think that that's a good example yes i think so too as, as i mentioned this study was made in 2020 and it was uh, actually right in this in the start of the, of the pandemic um so first of all uh, i mean um it was um, first of all, it was said by by many, and I will say also that the respondents were on, on an individual base, not representing the country always. So that is one point. But uh, first of all, um, most of the the respondents said that uh, 
it was too the recommendation was too new to see any any special specific um, effect uh, but uh, they also uh, could confirm that um, due to the pandemic uh, the whole uh, issue of openness the whole issue of sharing and the sharing culture had increased uh, a lot so that was i mean maybe some of the main uh, results from that report but i can also mention i have myself um, together with, for example, Daniel Burgos, who is here today, maybe you can comment as well. We have been involved in two large uh, research um, uh, studies. Um, one, will, one will be presented, uh, I think it is on Wednesday for this conference, a global study about open education and open science. And that also mentioned about uh, the pandemic and, and um, COVID, but also another study by, by Aras Buskart where I think we were some 35 researchers around the globe covering 65% of the, or almost 70% uh, of the countries in the world, who um, were all countries uh, and all respondents and researchers said that, uh, again, that the culture of sharing, the use of OER and the use of MOOCs, and the whole issue of open educational practices um, and the culture, as I said, and the people's attitudes and this kind of things really had changed. Um, to a huge extent. So I think we have we have already seen so much by research. And I mean, all of you have been involved in so many projects, so you can, I think, confirm it. I don't know if you, Daniel, would say something about those uh, research reports. If you have the right to speak, <laughs> I don't know. Everybody can speak. I don't know okay. if Daniel is here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm, okay, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna, um, while I don't see Daniel straight away, so I don't know if he's around, but I'm gonna say, and this is coming yeah, totally. Yes, okay, some go for it, Daniel. So, yeah. Connecting and listening. There is an interrupted connection here. Sorry for that. How can I? So, do you want to comment on? Um, Eva's comments, so about kind of the use of open educational resources in during times of pandemic. Yes, of course, I'm trying. I The connection is not good, so sorry for that. Oh, yes, I was uh, listening to Eva's because, in fact, we have commented very much on, on, on this extensively for the last two years and across the continents. And I think it's, there is a very well cross uh, approach about who we are in times of pandemic because we've been working with uh, many countries in the five continents. Um, I think that we all share the same feeling of um, the urgent need to use something that is useful for everyone. And then the use of OER meant that uh, people were a little more aware of using the OER and also producing stuff to others. So the feeling of uh, being generous and self-given also to contribute to the OER um, uh, umbrella and not just to consume the resources, I think it was one of the main feelings that arise, uh, arose from these uh, last months, okay? So the point is that uh, to me, the most understand the interesting part is that there is a flow. Uh, sometimes we complain, just to say the word politely, but we complain, but the sometimes is that uh, there is an unilateral way of approaching OER that is me taking whatever is uh, possible from the repositories and not me contributing to those repositories because the providers are just a group it's not everyone and i think the feeling of giving and taking and having this flow and exchange between all the people around even between uh, countries and, and and languages i think it's a quite improvement in this pandemic so um, the situation brought something good which is the feeling of actually sharing in both ways Um, just to offer a brief perspective on this, um, I'm not teaching um, at the moment, so it's not personal experience, more just what I've picked up on. Most of the um, move during the pandemic to online education, to me, was characterised by chaos and crisis management and people not necessarily with any training on how to do online learning going, I've got to do online learning now, like next week. <laughs> so. I'm just going to have a go and just try and do it. And a lot of those people are not really aware of open education or OER options at all. 
right? Um, and I would say the main sort of advantage, I mean, there's two ways with this, right? Uh, it, commercial companies have been very quick to go into that space and say, here you go, here's the complete solution to the problem that you've got. Here's a, an online curriculum for you to use, but it's all proprietary and often um, locked down into particular technology or licensing option. Um, in some ways, the best option with all this is to take advantage of the chaos, right? Um, and the fact that there is a bit of a rupture between the way things were being done before and the way things are gonna be done in the future. And there is a chance there to advocate for open approaches. Um, but the, the challenge is that there's commercial publishers with entire marketing departments already doing that. They're already trying to have the conversations with the vice chancellors and so on. So, um, Again, it's that idea of coordination. How do we make sure that we advocate um, that open approaches are the way to go with um, moving education online? Um, I think that's quite a big challenge, actually, um, because in a way there's now a fork in the road where increased use of online and blended learning can be filled with commercial options and it can be filled with uh, more open options, some blend of the two. But, um, because all the pieces are kind of up in the air at the moment, it remains to be seen how it will all pan out. It could be the beginning of something big, um, a move towards openness, but it could just as easily be a move towards very locked, very closed proprietary learning systems that fill that space. So it's an interesting crossroads in a way. I'm gonna bring you very quickly again, um, my, this is again totally my experience because it kind of goes slightly against Daniel's and, and Eva's. I, so I'm originally from Spain, but, I'm, but I work in the Netherlands. And as Rob said, pandemic hits, it's like, just give me something I have to teach online. I need something quick, right? Um, so yes, it is true that we have seen, and I do work with, with teachers on a regular basis, we have seen more teachers consuming OER, but not necessarily sharing what they create beyond the five, four walls of the institution, right? So that was kind of, it is true that we should kind of take this opportunity to not let them go back to the way they used to do things. And, you know, since they're creating more stuff online, for example, we should be able to kind of grab them and say, okay, so now please just, I'm gonna push you gently for you to continue doing this. But um, let me, cause I'm conscious of the time and I really, really wanted to kind of touch on everything on not everything, but this is something that's kind of worrying me. And this is in connection with this, what I was asking you earlier about, um, about the different needs, and now you've brought in this idea of coordination. But to be honest, I was very curious and somehow surprised to um, hear about this idea of fragmentation, right, Rob, that you were talking about in connection to fragmentation being a challenge. Right. Um, I did not necessarily see fragmentation as a challenge. So, so that's what kind of prompted very quickly all this thinking about, yes, we're diverse. Does that mean that we are fragmented? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? See where I'm going? Yeah, um, I would say fragmentation isn't distributed equally, right? So some places are more fragmented than others. But you have to look at all of the different stakeholder types that this is relevant to. So yeah, within open education, through conferences like this, there's a lot of people connecting through open networks, open communities, and they're quite porous and it's quite easy for people to get into those. Um, but if you look at the sort of policy frameworks across Europe as a whole, they're quite uneven. Um, if you look at the level of provision, it's quite uneven. So um, what we don't have is a European wide approach. We don't, you know, we have um, different activity in different places, but what we don't have is, is an understanding of the ecosystem as a whole and where to direct the efforts for things as a whole, um, because people can only really talk about their own context and their own kind of situations. Um, and sometimes people make great progress in those and that spreads, but, um, but yeah, I would say there's still, work to be done to meet the potential of open education approaches, right? So we've got sort of models for how it can work and we've got sort of proof of concept and successful examples, 
But what we don't have is a strategy for how to roll it out across the whole of Europe and uh, advocate for it in the right way. Um, and if you just look at the fact that we're way below 5% proliferation of OER into education, publishing and use of resources, there's massive uh, potential for more coordination and more impact. Um, but yeah, it's not to say that there isn't activity in a lot of places and it's not connected in some way. It's just that as a whole, for society, it's happening in pockets still. It's just that we're in the pockets, you know, we're in the echo chamber all the time and we're talking to people who know about OER. And but, I think, yeah, we can, we can, sorry, carry on, I'll say it afterwards. No, no, I was just gonna say, I think too much fragmentation and because you say, because we are in these pockets, we can sometimes miss the way that with the best will in the world that can entrench inequalities of access that are already there. Because the last thing in the world that we want, and we've seen this in the book sphere a lot, is to accidentally create like a two tier system or a three tier system even where the people who would probably be in a position, be in the, the better position to be able to purchase traditional hard copies or traditional ebook copies are the ones with the ability to coordinate and, and access and network around OA, um, OA um, what's the word I'm looking for? Things you can use, you know, um, <clears throat> affordances. And I think that if we kind of stay in our pockets too much, we miss, we might, um, accidentally we might kind of entrench that system by accident mm. I, I would agree that a non-fragmented world would be an ideal uh, something that we should strive to achieve but uh, as we said earlier many of us were in disaster recovery mode when the pandemic started so there is fragmentation between the people who were actually very good at open and distance education and the people who just wanted, well, I need to do my lecture next week. I need to reach out to my existing students, regardless of the fact that it is a good or bad open education practice. So that is also something that we need to consider. Another thing that we need to consider is that openness is often a matter of degree. We are using Zoom today. We're not using an open source alternative. So one of the challenges we faced, I'm afraid, is not only a two-tiered, three-tiered, multi-tiered system, uh, keeping in mind the dynamic that we want uh, to, the goal, to, the ultimate goal we want to achieve. And in the meantime, we need to understand better the compromise we have to make in different regions of the world between open education, commercial education, and state-sponsored education. In, a, in Africa, most of my colleagues are better than we are in France, because in France, we are rich. We have state universities. In Africa, they tell me that, you know, we have 10% of the space needed for the students that we need to educate. So we need to have commercial providers. So we need to regulate, to be able to regulate commercial providers. So are they better than we are in France at regulating? commercial providers. So I think my message would be that we have an ideal, we need to go further toward the ideal, but uh, along the way, there will be compromise, compromises to be made and there will be adaptations to be made to the local system according to the maturity of each country, the educators, the legal, regulatory or market frameworks. And this is where we're going to leave it. Thank you so much, Jack, for um, the last, those last words. But um, we have to leave you guys because time is pressing. Um, I invite you all to continue the conversation in um, OET, so OE Global Connect. Let me just share the link in the chat. Um, if not, thank you so much. You've all been a wonderful. Um, and I'll see you around. Igor, you can stop the recording.